We're going to look at a passage in Numbers chapter 32 today, and I'm going to be speaking uh, once again on the topic this week three of, of Brave. And I want to talk to you specifically today about being all in. And uh, you know what it's like to, to kind of be half-hearted about something. You know what it's like just to do something to be doing it. But, but I know that there is an incredible um, um, blessing and an and incredible um, return our invest, on our investment when we, when we go all in. And, um, you know, I, I use this, this, this quite often, but you, you took a shower this morning, hopefully, and, and, you know, you just didn't wash one finger at a time, one toe at a time. You jumped all, come on, you jumped all in. And, and in relationships, you know, um, you go all in. Uh, in your love for, for, for people that, that are hard to love, uh, we go all in. And, and, you know, if you don't give your all, your employer is going to ask you to to go somewhere else because it's, it's in, in athletics and academics and every aspect of life, uh, we have so many times uh, just, just gone through the motions and not been, our hearts not been in it, but I, I want you to go all in today. I want you to focus with me for the next, uh, really, Pastor Joseph, I want you to bring your team up at 12 o'clock. We're going to, I'm going to do my best to present this in such a timely way that we're, we're going to go all in as we respond to the teaching of the word because I think it's very important that it's good for you to take notes and I encourage you to take notes I encourage you to to type in something on your on your phone but it's really important for us to understand we must be doers of the word and not just hearers only and when I say doers when we respond to the teaching of the word when we come to the altar and we pray and that God begins to solidify what word we received and then we start acting it out and so I'm a big proponent on on responding because listen the Holy Spirit can do more in a moment than we could do in a lifetime. And when we pray through something, and there's really an incredible principle Jesus taught us about laying on of hands. And you see, there's nothing special about my hands, but what it's called is transference, because I'm praying for you, and we're praying the Holy Spirit prays through us the very will of God. Jesus himself laid hands on many. I believe it's the example that we should follow. Now, if you're a germaphobe, get over it. Okay, really, because... Uh, because there's something very powerful in the it's not, psychologists, uh, doctors will tell you, and powerful in the in touch. Just very simple, uh, little babies. Um, you just touch them, and and, um, and isn't it crazy how COVID has made touch a bad word? And and our world has made touch. Oh, that's 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 evil. No. Oh. I'm so thankful that, that God touches our hearts and that we're also to touch a world that's lost and dying and that needs his hope. And so I believe in the power of, if you don't like that, then you go find you another church. We'll go to Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. I believe in the power of prayer, the power of praying with people. And in and, and Numbers chapter 32, the Reubenites, I'm going to read down 13 verses in the Gadites who had very large herds and flocks, saw that the lands of Jazar and Gilead were suitable for livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the community and said, Altareth, Dibon, Gazar, Nimrah, Hibsa, Eliadeo, Sibin, Nebum, Nerdebo, and Beon. Um, did, I, did I pronounce those very correctly, I don't have a clue, and I don't know that I care. Um, you, you should have a name like Bob and Leroy and so forth. Um, uh, it's a lot easier. Um, the land, and I'm not saying that to be uh, disrespectful, the land that the Lord subdued before the people of Israel are suitable for livestock, and your servants are, we have livestock. If we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. Now, hold on to the thought. Don't make us cross the Jordan. They were on the east side of the Jordan, the east side of the Jordan. And they could see over into the promised land, but the promised land was on the west side of the Jordan. Okay? Don't make us cross it. In other words, we are satisfied with this. This is good enough. Moses said to the Gadites, Reubenites, should your fellow Israelites go to war while you sit here? Why do you discourage the Israelites from crossing over into the land the Lord has given them? Why? Is this what your fathers did 
when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to look over the land, after they went up to the valley of Eshcol and viewed the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. Remember, he sent out the, the 12 spies. Two came back, said, we got this. It was Caleb, Joshua. The other 10 says, we can't. They're giants living in the land. We might as well just, just get out of here. now. Don't even think about doing it. We are grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way we can do this. And so they discouraged the people. Consequently, the Lord's anger, verse 10 was aroused that day, and he swore this oath. Because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of those who were 20 years old or more will come up out of Egypt, will, who have come up out of Egypt, will see the land I've promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one except Caleb, except Caleb, except Caleb and Joshua, for they followed me wholeheartedly. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wonder in the wilderness for 40 years until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight was gone. Father, I pray your help this morning. I pray to God you would, um, God, stir us within our hearts. God, I pray for focus and clarity. I pray for, God, that you would give us, God, just a very specific centeredness today as we look to your word and we receive, God, what you've given us to receive. We thank you, God, that you're moving in this place, and I pray for a great response in Jesus' name. Amen. So imagine, you've heard for generations, your grandpa, your grandpa's grandpa, I mean forever, about how that one day you're going to go from being a servant, a slave, to one day you're going to be owning this land, a land that's flowing with milk and honey, a land that is bountiful, a land that is so uh, amazing, had all kinds of natural resources, and one day you're no longer going to be under the tyranny of Egypt. One day it's going to happen, and you've heard this, and you heard this, and you heard this, and you're, you're excited about it, but you think it's never going to come, and then all of a sudden, in uh, and, and just, just a short time after the plagues, all of a sudden, uh, M Moses is leading the, the nation of Israel, and they're taking the plunder, they're taking a lot of spoils, uh, they're taking a lot of gold and silver, and... and and great things are happening, and you get to the edge of the Red Sea, and all of a sudden you hear the Egyptians are coming. You're like, here, here we go again. I knew this could, was too good to be true. And all of a sudden Moses holds up his staff, and you, you go across on dry ground, and, and all of a sudden the Red Sea, as the Egyptians are trying to cross over, comes back, and they all drown. And so you're just fascinated. God is leading your nation, your family, your people with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud by night. How cool would that be? I mean, they don't need GPS. God's showing them exactly where they want to go. You don't need your phone. God's saying, this is go, go here. And he's providing for them with manna. He's providing for every need they have. Two times he, he, he calls Moses. He tells Moses to hit a rock. And then he said, speak to the rock. And water comes out of the rock. They were able to drink in the middle of the desert. I mean, their shoes didn't wear out. Come on. And, and just so many amazing things were happening. And this generation had witnessed all this, and they're, 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 they're excited about what is about to happen next. And, but because they could not believe that God would take care of the giants in the land, God became angry, and God said no. He waited for the entire generation except for Joshua and Caleb to die off before he would allow them to go in the promised land. Now, fast forward 40 years. And there is, within the 12 tribes of Israel, two and a half tribes of the tribes of Israel that decided, you know what? We were good. We're just going to settle on this east side of the Jordan, and we're not going to go into the promised land with everybody else. And what happened was Moses really is upset by this. And he says, okay, but I want you to understand, God is not going to like this. And you're going to still have to fight with us, all the fighting men. You're still going to have to fight with us. But they chose for the reason of the fact that they had well-watered uh, well land and, and, and pasture there in the, in the plains of Jazar and Gilead, that they decided that's good enough. And so they settled. 
They literally settled. They're going to have to still fight. The men were, but the wives, think about this. The wives will be over here and their children and their livestock, and they would be unprotected because their husbands are having to fight battle after battle after battle before they receive the promise of the, of the promised land, their inheritance. But they were so convinced that, that they would, was, didn't really want to go any further. And so they decided, let's just settle here. And how sad is that? And the Bible says that God was so reminded of the generation of before that decided, you know what? We don't want to go fight these giants. We're, we're, like, we're like grasshoppers. We can't do this. And, and he says, you know what? Give them what they want. I want you to think about in your own life how many times, in my own life, how many we, times we all have settled We've settled for much less than what God wanted us to have. You see, God's plan is better than you and I can ever (laughs) ask, think, or imagine. God doesn't want you to settle for the addiction. God doesn't want you to settle and say, well, it's never going to happen to me, so I'm just going to accept it. I'm going to receive it. I'm just going to go ahead and live my life out the way that it is. God doesn't want you to to settle in your marriage that is is just not very good. There's not any life and love in it, no passion in it. God doesn't want you to settle for kids that have got one foot in the world and one foot in the church. God doesn't want you to settle for for your mundane walk with God. God wants you to have a passion and a know that his presence is in your life. God wants you to know that the greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. God wants you not to settle. Everybody say, I'm not going to settle. But we do it. We do it time and time again. Listen, I want to encourage you today. We're talking about all in. I don't want discovery or persons within our church to settle. And a lot of times the reason why we settle is because we're tired of fighting. We just get tired, and we think, you know what, I'm just, I'm just, but you know what, what the, the word of the Lord today for you is, if you're, if you're tired, he will strengthen you. We'll find in just a few minutes that Joshua, 40 years later, almost to the day, Joshua chapter 1, down through verse 13, God speaks to Joshua when he says five times, be strong and be very courageous for the Lord your God and with you wherever you go. Just as I was with Moses, because Moses had died, I will also be with you. Every place that your feet goes, I'm going to be there with you. Only be strong and courageous. He says, for, I don't want you to meditate on this word that I'm giving you. I want you to think about day and night because you'll be successful and you'll be prosperous if you'll think about the word that I'm giving you. God, Constantly remind yourself of what I'm saying right now. And he said, I want you to go throughout the camp of all Israel, and I want you to tell them, get ready for, in three days, get the provisions together, because in three days, we are going to inherit the promise. We're going to cross over the Jordan. What he didn't tell them, and I'm so glad God doesn't tell us the details, what he didn't tell them was Jordan was going to be at flood stage. That's kind of one of the things I would have liked to be you know, to know. But he didn't. And then he says, um, but remember the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, because they settled? Tell them they have to go still fight, but their possession or their inheritance is not going to be on the west side of the Jordan, but it's going to be on the east side of the Jordan because they settled. Which is going to be your possession? Are you going to decide that it's good enough, or are you going to decide that God is more than enough? I want you to know that I believe there are people within the house of God. God has a good and perfect will, but I believe in that good and perfect will, sometimes we settle for less than his best. We do. I talk to to, to young ladies, and and I'll I'll talk to young men, and I'll have premarital counseling. I'll talk to them, and and, and our, our three sons will all be married within six months. And the first thing I have when they come to me, Dad, I know this is God's will. Are you certain it's God's will? Are you settling in any way? Do you feel like this is God's perfect, pleasing will for your life? And there'll be times, now our sons were convincing. They said this is God's will. I'll talk to young ladies. You know what? But pastor, he, he's cute. Cute works for about six months. But pastor, she's hot. 
Now, I'll give it to you. Hot lasts for about a year. Come on, somebody. Say amen. <laughs> but pastor, he's got money. Well, money may last for about two years. Come on, let's be real. But pastor, she, she's from good family. She's coming, you know, or pastor, this is my favorite one. Pastor, her family's all jacked up. They're messed up. But you know what? I'm, I'm not marrying the family. Oh. Oh, yes, you are. Don't settle. Don't settle. You say, well, well listen, but, but pastor, I'm already married. Well, then listen, you're done. I've had people come to me, literally people say, well, I believe God's telling me that I need to divorce. Go, that ain't God. No. Except for the cause of infidelity or adultery, it's not God. Let's not settle. Listen, as a church, we can't afford to settle. There's a lost and dying world. And if we just decided enough is enough and we have more than enough people going to Discovery Church, we're in the wrong because Jesus said we're to go out the hedges, the highways, the byways and compel them to come to know Christ. And so we're going to do that and going to go forward continuing to do that because we, we, we had talked to the pastor, Pastor Trevor, several times this week in Kyle, Texas. And I said, listen, we're going to do everything we can to help you. Pastor, I need, we need some land. I know that. We're looking. We're praying. We're going to need some land. We've been helping El Reno, First Assembly of God Church. The Assemblies of God ask us, the Assemblies of God is, is what we are as a church. I'm not ashamed of it. We're Pentecostal. It is not a domination. It's a fellowship. It's a missions movement. But with that, I am a presbyter, and I'm responsible for the Oklahoma City Metroplex area for the churches. The church at El Reno, the pastor resigned about two months ago, actually three months ago now. And the district immediately, the leadership of the district asked me if Discovery Church would take under its leadership the, the church at El Reno. Listen, when we first started going about 12 weeks ago, there was about 15 people. And we've grown to about 50. But listen, that church is a, or that community is a community of 20,000. They got some jacked up people in that community, just like we do. There are some problems in that community, but I believe with all my heart, that community can be reached for the cause of Jesus Christ. We have egg hunts, and we've been doing this for about eight years now. We have egg hunts, and three and 4,000 people in that community will come, and they're so appreciative. You know what? I believe God has called us to reach El Reno for such a time as this. So let me give you some. Last Sunday night, we took it before the membership of the church, and 100% unanimously, we voted to say, yes, we want to take on that church. It's going to be now Discovery El Reno, and Discovery Church is going to be the leadership. We're going to be the guiding force. Listen. Yeah, you, yes, let's clap. But listen, you that are clapping, I'm taking notice because we don't have children's ministry over there right now. We don't have you uh, n nursery over there right now. We don't have, we, we are sending our teams to do worship, to do ministry, but it's very at an elementary level. But I believe with all my heart, we're not going to settle by just saying we're doing church. We're going to reach that community with the love and, and the message of hope and the message of grace. And we want to see backsliders come to know Jesus. We want to see people who are strung out on dope and on meth. And they, listen, the, the, it's off the charts what's happening. There's so many people that need that need Jesus in Canadian County. Canadian County is the fastest growing county in Oklahoma. And, and we have an opportunity to make a difference in the county seat. And this is not about discovery. This is about Jesus. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. We're not about going over there and lift. Yeah, it's going to be Discovery El Reno because we have a presence because we've been there. On occasion, I had a couple come to me, a, a mother and a daughter after the first service. as pastor, I don't know, this is our first Sunday here. She said, my, my husband works on the police force. And she said, my daughter here is a doctor. And she, both of them, just, just, just very excited, but yet also kind of nervous. They said, we feel like we need to help. What should we do? Listen, I'm scared to death because I don't want to fail. That church, we, are not, we don't have the resources in that church. The church's average age is about 70 years old. Not there's anything wrong with that. But it's hard to run a nursery when you're 70. It's hard to work with kids when you're 75. And, 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 but hear my heart. We've got to have people that have a heart to reach 
not just El Reno, but Yukon. We've got to have people that come alongside of us because we're not going to allow people and we're not going to be the church that settles where we are and thinks it's good enough. No, it's not good enough. We're people that are dying and going to hell that are on meth that need Jesus and we're going to love them into the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? And so I need your help. Listen, the church doesn't have any money. The church was built in 1965. The building over there, a two-story building has been condemned. We're trying to do what we can to save it. There's a, literally a crack. You say the church is broken. Oh, it's most definitely broken. Right down the middle of the aisles are broken. The cement is cracked. We're looking to relocate. We're hoping it'll sell. I'm just being real with you today because I want to be out of that little, that little neighborhood and I want to be visible. I want to reach that city for Jesus. Can you say amen? I want to do what we're doing at UConn. I want to do it there. And every activity that we're doing here, we're doing Fall Fest, we're doing Brave. I told him, I said, and Martha's like, you sure you want to do that? And I said, sure. There's only like five. She said, she said what are we going to do for all the people that want to come to Brave from Arena? I said, tell them it's free. Promo cover, uh, promo is free. Free El Reno, because I, listen, I want to pour into them. I want to love on them. I want, I, want to go, I want somebody that has a heart to drive buses to go get kids in middle school and high school and bring it over to our youth group. And then one day we're going to have a, a thriving youth ministry at UConn at Discovery in El Reno. Can you say amen? You see, if we are to sit here and say, this is all, this, this is great, this is good, but it's all about us. No, it's not. It's about the kingdom. I'm not going to be a screen on a, on a church over there. We're going, to pastor, we're going to plant a pastor over there. Now, that pastor is going to be preaching the same thing for a long time as I'm preaching. And he's going to come to our meetings. He's going to be part of our staff. But let me tell you, it's not about promoting a person. My name's not going to be on a sign. We're going to lift up the name of Jesus. And so, don't settle. I've got to give you some points. I've got to hurry. All in. Number one, get ready. Joshua went through the camp, said, get ready. Get ready for what? Nothing's happened. Nothing's happened for a long, long time except people dying. You go to a lot of funerals in 40 years and people just dying. And people just wondering every day, what are you doing? I'm wondering today. What are you doing? I'm wondering today. You know what wondering is? It's going nowhere. You know, a lot of people in our world are wondering. You know, a lot of churches are just wondering. They don't know what they're even doing, to, to, to why they're even doing it. Let's not wonder. Get ready. And you know, a lot of it, getting ready, is preparation mentally. Change your mindset. Begin to prepare yourself for what God wants to do in your family, in your home. Prepare. Do you know, the opposite of preparing is procrastination. You begin to put off, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. No, do it now. Prepare yourself for the blessing God wants to give you. Prepare. Prepare. We're going to have to prepare for what God's going to do. We're already preparing. We've cleaned out. We've done drum, dumpster. We've, we've hauled off nine Tractor trailer semi loads of trash. You think I'm kidding? I'm not even kidding. Stuff been in there 40 years. I don't want us to look back at Discovery Church in 40 years from now and look and talk about our glory days. I want us to keep going forward and say, look what God is doing now. I'm thankful for what he did then, but I'm, I'm excited about what he's doing now and what he's going to do tomorrow. But, and I want to pour into this generation, so we've got to get ready. Secondly, we've got to, we've got to lead. Joshua let the people know, hey, you got to be all in. There's two and a half of the tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's not all in. But I need you to be all in. And God said, Joshua, you need to lead them into the promise that I swore their ancestors I would give them. I want to ask yourself, I want you to ask yourself this question. Who are you leading and where are you leading them to? This has been going over my spirit. Who am I leading? I hope I'm leading my wife. I hope I'm leading my boys. I hope I'm leaving, leading my staff, our staff. I hope I'm leading our church. But if I really am leading them, where am I leading them to? Do they really see me have a heart for God? Do, I really, do they really see that I, I'm a witness to them? Do I really see that? You see, I believe we need to do everything with intentionality. I believe we need to do everything that we can with the understanding that we are to be his hands and feet to this world. I've been witnessing, I've been going to different hairdressers, and I'm not a hairdresser guy, I'm just a barbershop guy. But they put a, a new um, a place over here, I think it's, what's the name of it? I don't know, it's like a hairdresser, right across, it's, 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 and you can go in, you can get a, you can get a uh, water, a Coke, a beer, and I'm like, okay, 
So I go in, and every time they're like, you sure you don't want a beer? And I'm like, no, I don't want a beer. 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 And the lady, she cut my hair. First of all, the young lady started cutting my hair, and I started talking about Jesus. She said, yeah, I don't want anything to do with that Jesus stuff. And I thought, you don't know the power of prayer can change your life. Then she starts talking to me about she has a daughter. It's not good, but she loves her daughter. And then she wasn't able to cut my hair one day, so another woman cut my hair. Well, that woman started coming to church. Can I tell you that this morning, the 9 o'clock service, the woman, the older woman, and the young lady who said she would never be to church, both of them gave their hearts to Jesus today. And I love it. I love it. And she said, for the longest time, she said, I kept wondering why you won't make them to your church. She said, you even tell me you're a preacher. I said, I didn't have to. She said, I probably would have come before then if you would have told me that. I said, probably not. <laughs> lead. There are people, listen, if you don't lead your family, I promise you, someone else will. You don't lead your 15-year-old son, you think it's all good, someone else is going to lead them. You don't lead your daughter, someone else is going to lead them. Number three, no one obey the word of God. Remember what the Lord spoke to you. Remember his promise he gave you. Remember, God's given you promises, Bryce. God's given you promises, Eric. God's given you promises, Chad. God's given you promises. And so often times we settle for far less than those promises become reality because we think it's just, just never going to happen. I literally have a journal that I write the promises of God down. Can I back it up what I'm saying with El Reno? How many of you remember G.W. Van Horn? He was our senior adult pastor. He was pastor of El Reno First Assembly of God two different times. G.W. Van Horn for years, literally for 20 years, almost 20, I've been here uh, 17, almost 20 years. In fact, one of the first conversations is, is he said, we need to start in El Reno. We need to start church in El Reno. We need to start church in El Reno. And about 10 years before he passed away, I did his services last two years ago in May. I wrote down in my prayer journal, G.W. Van, Van Horn will not leave me alone about starting a church in El Reno. I said, so God, I'm, I'll do what you want me to do because I don't know everything. Don't be afraid to speak what God's given you into someone else's life. And it may look crazy in that time. Remember his word that he gave you. Maybe you were two, maybe it was two years ago, maybe you were 10 years old, maybe you were 50. Hold on to his word. And the last thing is this don't ever settle. Don't settle, don't settle. Don't be the person that says this is good enough. I don't need to go any deeper in my walk with God. Don't settle. Don't settle. About a year and a half before I met Martha, I guess I told the Lord, I'm sick of dating. I'm tired of spending my own money. I'm, you know, if I go Dutch, they don't like me, you know, so, you know what Dutch is, yes, you know, so. So I'm like, done. And God said, I was waiting for you to get to that place. And a year later, a year and a half later, I met my bride. And I didn't settle. If you look at how many people in the Bible settled, it's a lot settled. Abraham and Sarah settled. And I know with God's grace, God's grace is bigger than our settling. But God doesn't want to live in our settlement that we've settled. So, can you imagine the excitement? Can you imagine the moment, all of a sudden, they're about to inherit the promised land? And then Joshua looks over at you, and he's, he said, yeah, we're all getting excited. We're all fixing to cross over into the, the Jordan, and we're going to go on the other side. We're going to start, and we're going we're gonna to see this land flowing with milk and honey. But... 
the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. You can't go. You can go to help us fight, but it's not going to be yours. I wanted, to, I wanted to use my point three. If you're going to be all in, I was going to say instead of don't ever settle, I was going to say don't be a butt. But my wife said that was not politically correct, so I'm sorry. But how many times? This is my conviction. How many times God says, I want to bless you, but you keep settling. Listen to me. (laughs) If you've been called to preach, I don't care if you're a young lady or a young man, God's called you to preach. Don't settle for thinking, but I'm a young lady and I'm 26 years old and I, I, you know, no, no. Don't settle for anything less than God's best for your life. Do not settle. But but, but, but I've got to do this and I've got to go this direction. Don't settle. Do it His way. Don't settle. Let's be a church that's not settled. I want to be a strong foundation. I want to help people. I want to start and build more churches. El Reno, it's not just, just, it's going to be more. And that scares me. But I'm more scared of not, not acting upon God saying, do it. How are we going to get the money? I don't know. I don't have a three-month plan or a six-month plan or a three-year plan. But I know God said, do it. I'm going to need your help. We had serve day, team day last week. I asked you to sign up. I need more people to sign up. You know what you do, what God will do when you... When you serve his house, it's still honor your house. Big time. But I'm telling you, don't settle. Be all in. Be all in. Would you stand with me? God, I thank you for your spirit that's moved in this place today. And I know that, God, it's not by my or by power, but it's by your spirit. God, I pray your spirit will culminate in this place of people that says, I'm not settling anymore. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You need Jesus to forgive you of sin. You come all the time. This may be your very first day. There's something in your life that's not not right with God. You need Jesus to forgive you. I'm not going to embarrass you. On the count of three, just simply raise your hand. One, two, three. I need Jesus to forgive me. I need Jesus to forgive me. Hands going up. Yeah, lots of hands. Lots of hands. Don't be ashamed. You that are raising your hands, just look at me. I see you up in the risers. I see you down below. Look at me. Not to embarrass you, but I want you to pray this prayer with me, okay? Lots of people raising their hands. Say this prayer. Sir Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Come on, everybody pray with them. Come, please come into my heart. Please save me. Please change me. And from this moment on, I'm going to do my best to live for you. But I'm going to need your help to do that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And listen, there was about 13 people at least. I couldn't count just all of them, but at least 13 people and so I'm going to ask you in just a moment you can go come with everybody else because we're going to pray with you you said I thought you wouldn't embarrass me I'm not I want you to know how important it is for us for us to pray with you and for us to pray together and so we're going to pray with you now let's be honest let's get real how many of you have been given a promise There's quite a few people I'm sure how many of you have been given a promise by God but it's not happened yet raise your hand raise your hand all over this place raise your hand raise your hand raise your hand now for you that are raising your hand in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to come forward because we're going to pray. Because God's promises, this is what he says, are yes and In other words, God can't lie. Right? So are you going to settle for a maybe or for a might? Or are you going to say, I'm going to fight for my promise? Right? 
And let me tell you, I beg you, do not settle. You come to this day and you say, as a child of God, I claim my inheritance in Jesus Christ and I'm more than a conqueror. And because of whose I am, not who I am, because whose I am, I have a right to be able to say, Jesus, you gave me that promise and that promise is gonna be fulfilled. I believe it, I'm gonna stand on it. And so on the count of three, you've been given a promise. I want you to come to this front right now. We're gonna pray. If you've raised your hand for salvation, you've already received your promise. Come on, come on, stand across this front. One, two, three, come on right now. Don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed. In the and the risers down the, center, the, the main floor, come right now. We're gonna have people gather around people in this place, come on. I need our leadership team, come help us. Come on, in the risers, you raise your hand for salvation. Several couples up there, come on, come on. With the rest of them, even in the front, come on. We're gonna pray with you. Don't be embarrassed, don't be afraid, don't be ashamed. Now church family, would you help us pray? If you're a leadership part of our team, come help us pray. If you know family or friend, come help us pray. Church. Stretch your hand this way. Pastor Joe and team's gonna lead us, but we're gonna pray. Come on, we're gonna believe God for the promises to be realized. The promised land is gonna happen. Thank you, Lord.